Okay, so not knowing whether any of you have seen this or not, I'll just show you what um, one way of thinking about FM, which is this. Okay, first off, let's files. Uh, and the danger here, of course, is that, or the issue here is going to be that uh, there's much too much going on, but we will just start. PD, media, test audio, MIDI, give me a test tone. Oh, wow, it's working. And now I'm going to say new, and I'm going to start making FM. So I think, um, where did I put that wonderful spectrum analyzer? That's the next question. Spectrum analyzer. There it is. Okay. So let's go get that open. This is just a nice thing that I can throw signals at and look at spectra of. And then the reason, my reason for having this here is so that we can make stuff and look at its spectrum, which is going to be done like this. So first off, what does an oscillator do for you? Uh, so now I take that and I send it to spec graph. And then I, oh, spec graph. And, all right, there's the spectrum of what comes out of OSC tilde. No surprises there. How do you do FM? How do you do FM? First, I'll do it the, the way that uh, everyone has taught you how to do it, which is you say phaser. Um, you, you need to make a carrier oscillator, but the carrier oscillator has to be a phaser and a uh, carrier, sorry, phaser and a, and a table lookup separate like this. So I'll say 440 hertz. Oh, that was interesting. Okay, there's, there's phaser. And by the way, look at all the wonderful foldover that phaser gives you. So don't ever use phaser as a signal generator like this. Instead, what you always need to do with phaser is say cosine, please. And then out comes our nice sinusoid. Um, this is a wonderful thing. This is wave shaping this very complicated spectrum. And you could actually add up what all the incoming peaks of this phaser should do to this and then do all the cross products and everything, and everything would wonderfully cancel out except for this one peak, even though everything is completely full of foldover somehow in the medium term. So actually, the wave shaping point of view is actually not a very good way of thinking about phaser going into a wave table. All right, okay. And now to make this thing be FM, one takes another oscillator, any oscillator, and one adds that, the output of this oscillator to the phase here. And it, of course, has to have a multiplier by an index, which I'm just going to make be a single number like that. Actually, I'm going to say over 100. So index will be in 100th. And now I will take this thing and just um, explicitly add it, even though I could just put it in the other. I could just put them both in the cosine. It would work, but this will be better. And now I start, oh, I need to give this a modulating frequency, such as 110. And now as I push the index up, you see the sidebands grow in the classic FM way. And then you probably want to be able to hear this now, so actually you probably have heard enough, so you don't. But Oh, and I don't have a copy of output here. Yeah, this I don't need. But there is another nice shell window I have somewhere. All right. Okay, try it again. Got an output. Throw it in both speakers, and then you'll hear the wonderful FM sound. Now, cosine of, oh, can I start my Inkscape and give you an equation? Let's do this. So now we say Inkscape. Um, so to analyze what goes into this cosine, let's see, open recent, please, the most recent one. <laughs> That was a good picture, uh, but I'm going to say new, uh, no, save as. And this is now going to be 5A. And I don't know what to call it. All right, everybody go away. All right, so, here, uh, so here's an equation. Cosine, this is, oh, plug in the tablet. And of course, this is where everything goes downhill. Tablet gets plugged into computer. 
And of course, there's the fundamental, uh, fundamental equation of computer music, which is, ooh, is that going on again? Cosine of A plus B is cosine A sine B plus sine A, whoops, I did it wrong. That was nonsense. Cosine A cosine B minus sine A sine B. All right? So now what we go is we go over to the patch and we just do that. We replace the cosine with all that other stuff that I just wrote, like this. Uh, actually, I'm going to what am I going to do? I'm going to copy everything and do it all over so that you can see the equivalence of the two networks. Duplicate. Uh, that's bad because... Okay, let's get rid of this. Okay, so now instead of this cosine, I'm going to have two things. Uh, well, t uh, sum of two products. Right? So let's just make ourselves have a sum so I can work backwards. And the sum is going to be of the cosine of somebody times the cosine of somebody else. Ask no cosine. So what am I going to take the cosine of? I'm going to take the cosine of the phaser, and I'm going to take the cosine of the. Sorry. Ah, come on. And I'm going to take the cosine of the modulating oscillator. And I'm going to multiply those two together. How about this? And then I'll do the same thing with the signs. Now, to get a sign again, we take we subtract a quarter cycle and take the cosine. It's stupid, but that's how PD works. Same deal. In fact, the same stuff. I mean, oh, tilde's there. again. Uh, plus, and now we're going to add those two like this. No, actually we're going to subtract them, aren't we? And yeah, thank you. This, these should be multipliers and not adders. And let's see now. What happens now when I turn this on? I get my, well, you know, identities are identities. If this didn't work, I would be in serious trouble. So you should see here that, the, that we're getting the same spectrum out of there as we got out of the other. And furthermore, it should sound the same. All right. On the other hand, you can, um, well, first off, this is not a bad transformation to pull off for one interesting reason, which is that now all of a sudden I have split my FM into two different components. Ooh, let's, uh, let me do something simpler. So we're going to listen to this. And meanwhile, I'm just going to take one of these out. Ha! Huh. And we lost half the peaks. And here, we got the other peaks. So in fact, each of these networks is one half of a voice of FM. And we add them up and you get the whole thing. But now we have an even and odd harmonic breakdown of the same, of the FM thing. Now, um, uh, so what is this really? What this is is a, an oscillator and another oscillator, which is the same except it's just out of phase. And then what we have here is a wave shaping instrument, which I can play you. For instance, here is the cosine of this oscillator. And that's just plain old wave shaping. Oh, by the way, I didn't move the spectrum over. Here's the spectrum of what you're listening to. All right? Straight old wave shaping, which, by the way, gives you the same annoying disappearing partials tricks. And furthermore, well, okay, and then if I were to take that and multiply it by this, that's just ring modulation. That just takes this thing and ring modulates all these peaks, which is essentially the same thing as sliding them over so that they're centered at 440 hertz instead of... 110. So this is the carrier frequency, which is the center of the cluster of peaks. Uh, by the way, the, uh, there's a DC peak here that you don't see because that's being filtered out because it's confusing. And that's and so this is an 
in some way an analysis of why the peak frequencies in, in FM are what they are. They can't be otherwise. The, the frequencies here are, t uh, sorry, the frequencies here, when you take the cosine of this oscillator, that uh, gives you frequencies that are multiples of 220 because this is an even function. And this one gives you frequencies which are odd multiples of 110. So between these two, the multiples are all the multiples of 110, except they're separated into the even ones and the odd ones. And then we're, and then we're taking that whole thing and ring modulating it by 440. Well, that's the same thing as saying the components of FM should be 440 plus or minus all the possible multiples of 110. And so that's a complete explanation for what the frequencies are in the spectrum that FM makes. Now, why the amplitudes are what they are, you have to go into the Bessel function jazz, regardless of which way you do this. So I'm not going to do the Bessel function jazz. Um, that's, for, that's for somebody else who actually can remember the Bessel function jazz, which I can't. It's an integral, a Fourier integral. Questions about this? This is FM from sort of the radically know-nothing uh, point of view. And I can't remember if this overlaps with stuff that I mentioned back when I was mentioning FM myself or not. And now I'm just going to leave this topic altogether and go back to stuff that is slew limiting and stuff related to compounding and try to relate that to nonlinear filtering a little bit more, a little bit better than I have before. Okay, so I'm just going to leave this topic altogether. Having, having shown you how the... Uh, Having shown you the tie-in between that and, and 270A. Don't need that. And now, let's see, I've got PD open, so I can say new. And by the way, how about, let's get a reasonable font size. Oh, do I want to do new? Think, think, think. Okay, so where we got last time was this. Let's actually open the file from last time. It was called... Uh, I actually made a copy here, but I gave it a bad name. I better say, I, well, I'll just open it anyway. Well, this is going to confuse you. Okay, I'm going to renumber this too somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to open it. All right, everything is going wrong today. All right, um, this is as far as we got last time. Uh, what we got was um, this PD small block size was going to do a thing, and the thing was going to be to read whatever its inlet gives us, which in the thing, which in the application, which is a compander, is going to be the um, is going to be a rectified version of the signal. Uh, specifically, in this particular implementation, I think, yeah, I just squared the signal to, to make sure that it was a positive number. Or actually, it does make sure it's a positive number, but specifically what comes out of here is the instantaneous power of the signal. And then what we're going to do here is low-pass the low-pass filter that power, but to do it, do it in a way that, um, uh, sorry, do, do it in a do it in a way that is not linear because the linear way of low-pass filtering it wasn't terribly good. So to reiterate that, huh, somehow I, I think I lost the patch that I did this on, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it again. So first off, uh, I, need, I need more points in my array here, I think. Something like that. I'm going to give it some screen size too. Uh, hey, no. All right. Now, now what I'm going to try to do is show you the result of uh, of estimating the um, estimating the envelope of the sinusoid that I'm going to put in. Okay. So sinusoid. Come, okay. So we don't have poodle anymore. Yeah, I think I do. I think I'm going to do this. Now we're going to be playing with an oscillator. Uh, just to um, just to give you a repeatable experiment, what I'm going to do is make a button that that turns the oscillator on 
and immediately starts graphing the output of my, not this, but to start with, of the, in, the measured envelope of the oscillator. So to do that, we need a button. Oh, we need a way to turn this thing off, which is going to be, let's see a message which says zero. And then we need to be able to turn it on. Yeah, I guess I'm just going to turn it on without any enveloping at all. But at the same time as I turn it on, I'm also going to bash the phase of the oscillator to minus one quarter. really going to do this. And the purpose of this is so that I can turn it on without having, uh, without having a, an annoying click. So it's going to annoyingly click when I turn it off. But when I turn it on, um, by setting the phase to zero, I'm fixing it so that the sinusoid at the very outset has a, um, has a zero crossing. And just to prove that that's happening, I'll graph it actually to verify that's happening. Ooh, nothing is coming into there because I'm probably graphing, yes, because I'm graphing nonsense, so I'm going to graph the oscillator. Yeah, okay. So what this is is a, is a way deterministically of turning the thing on without clicking. Is it clear how I did all that? This, um, if you want to make um, percussive sinusoidal sounds, which are frequently very useful for various things, you really want to control the, the uh, starting phase of the thing because otherwise all your attacks will sound different from each other. So this is a good thing to remember to do. Only in this kind of situation when you are brutally enveloping an oscillator at the outset. Oh, okay. So, and I want to brutally envelope it because I want the, uh, I want to give the uh, envelope follower as much possible trouble as I can. Like this. Let's, let's start looking at what the envelope follower says about this sinusoid. Nothing. Oh, because for some reason I didn't, I disconnected that. Oh, and it says nothing. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I had to give it a slew time. So I'll give it some slew speed, and then we'll try again. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so this is my envelope follower trying to, trying to follow my sinusoid. In fact, even now, it is following the sinusoid imperfectly, but is doing at least a sort of a decent job so that when I try to use that to control the amplitude, I get something not too far from the original sinusoid. And of course, this is a hideously low frequency. If I gave this a reasonable frequency to try out, like 440, uh, then if I do the same experiment, whoa hates me. What am I doing? Oh, right. This is, this is me uh, just showing you what you would hear, but I didn't play it for you. Uh, this, so, th uh, let's see. Let's get this thing to quiet down. Um, what was going on here was we were, we were taking the envelope out of the sinusoid, or out of, I think I had a drum sample that I was playing through this uh, last time that uh, made it clear what was going on, but the basic deal was try to, try to measure the envelope, and then uh, which, which is measuring the aver average power and then taking the square root, and then um, doing something and then dividing the thing by its own amplitude so that the resulting, the resulting amplitude in some measure of amplitude should now be 1. Right? And the result is, um, well, the result is amplitude 1 all right as long as you're, um, uh, yeah, that's, as long as you're doing this. Actually, um, it's more than one because the thing is measuring, in some sense, the RMS. It, uh, it, it's taking the power, and then it's taking the square root of a, a, a mean of the power, and so it is uh, giving me an RMS1 thing. So to make it actually work out exactly right, I should now multiply this by 1 over the square root of 2. Oh, 
oh, that's because I'm, that's what I'm dividing by. I need to divide by the square root of 2. Yeah, that's kind of bad. All right. There it is. All right. So I actually got my sinusoid to be roughly RMS1. Not exactly. I can make it much more exact if I make this much slower, I believe. No, can't do it. All right. Well, whatever. It's, it's good enough the way it is. All right. So now, uh, the only thing is when you, um, of course, when I measured the envelope uh, at the onset of the sinusoid, I, I saw this, um, I saw this rise shape like this. And so, of course, it's going to divide by that rise shape to try to correct the amplitude of the sinusoid, and that's not going to be terribly good. In fact, it's going to look and sound like this. Oh, it didn't even ah, it didn't even uh, calm down after the end of my 2,000 points here. And now, if I look at it again, it's going to be correct. All right. Well, that's not really to be avoided. Uh, what's what's happening here is that uh, this is one over the envelope. No, it's not. Uh, here's here's what it's correcting the amplitude of the sinusoid by. It's measuring the amplitude of the sinusoid roughly as being this. And it's dividing by that, so it's uh, multiplying by its reciprocal, which is this. Oh, uh, yuck. I have to make a signal that's 1 and divide by that to show you what it'll decide to multiply by. <laughs> and it, you know, it decided that it wanted a whole lot of gain. A whole lot of gain. Like how much gain? We don't have a scroll bar yet, but I can make there be a scroll bar. That much gain. <laughs> uh, woo. Oh, yeah, it's, it's still out of the table, but okay, you get the idea. This is, um, oh, well, uh, all right, so now what I should do, unfortunately, is put a metronome on this so that you can enjoy what happens when I start changing the time constant. Right, so now what's going to happen is I'm going to say metronome, and once a second, toggle. And I'll run the experiment once a second. Oh, right. Wrong, because I have to get it turned off. And now, yeah, so I guess it's regraphing this thing every time. Yep. <laughs> okay, good. Well, well, the problem, obviously, is that the thing isn't correcting the thing fast enough, right? So we could go in here and we could say, well, our slew limit, which is really only 5 per second, I could make me be faster. And we're sort of getting a reasonable result now, except if we graph what actually the sinusoid looks like, it might not look quite like we wish. <laughs> there it is. So it's a sinusoid that uh, is about twice as loud as it should be on the first cycle, and then after that it calms down. Okay. This is, um, this is as compared to the original sinusoid. Oh, sorry. This is as compared to the original sinusoid, which sounded like this. So here, actually, here the Ignore the clicks on the way out, but the the, uh, the the beginning is perfectly smooth, right? Well, as far as I know, there is actually no way to, to do this perfectly, but you can you can get close to doing it perfectly. That's to say, close to getting your sinusoid to be. Oh, what's, should I make a should make a real problem out of this so you can see what why this is possibly an interesting thing to do. Um, to make a real problem out of this, I would make this thing decay over a certain amount of time so that the limiter would, or compressor would be trying to, to give us a constant amplitude sinusoid out. And to do that, I would have to say, make this a divide tilde, and here, I'm not even going to show that. I'm going to make there be a line. And it's going to start out at 100, and then it's going to go down to 0 in a second. I don't even need to turn it off. 
shield up. Okay, try this. All right, elevator. And then our attempts to uh, turn that into a nice compressed sinusoid is now like this. <laughs> okay. So what's happening now is, oh, how am I going to explain this? Well, I can make it worse, and then you can see how it's going to work. The, the deal is when the, when the sinusoid ends up with a very low amplitude, the slewing per second turns out to be more able to limit the slew of the sinusoid itself. In other words, Limiting the slew, that limit is going to limit it more ferociously when the amplitude is large than when the amplitude is small because the rate of change is higher when the thing is larger. And so what's happening here is it's probably giving us a nice clean envelope result at the very outset. Uh, where can I see that? Measured envelope. Measured envelope is here. But now if I, um, let's see, how do I say this? Now if I, um, oh, I guess I can just say it this way. As, as this thing then loses power as we wait later and later into the note, if you call that a note, like say if I, I graph this after a half a second. Oh, wait, I wanted to keep that. And I wanted to start graphing after a half a second. Oh, better yet. No. Half a second. Yep, yeah, okay, and now I'll wait 600 milliseconds and 900 milliseconds. And now what's happening is the, um, the, the wavering up and down is relatively larger compared to the size, of, uh, relatively larger compared to zero, which is right here. So what's happening now is that this waveform is getting is getting divided into the sinusoid waveform so that what we now see in the sinusoid itself, the amplitude corrected sinusoid is starting to look funny. It's starting to look not quite so sinusoidal. And of course, one thing that I was telling you was uh, a good way to deal with that is to make it slew down slowly. Uh, why is this thing not changing? Oh yeah, that should just be helping it. And then the measured envelope looks more like this. Oh, let me show you the change. So here's fast slewing. And then if I make it slew slower downward, then you get stuff that doesn't vary as much. So now suddenly things are less symmetrical. And now if I make it slew up quickly, uh, I guess it's already slewing up quickly enough that you can't see it. And now we finally have something that isn't doing too bad, a, uh, isn't doing too much violence to the sound of the sinusoid, although it's really not quite perfect yet. Okay. Um, okay, now, I'm not sure, I don't want to go, you know, completely off the end of the, off the edge of the universe telling you everything that you want to know about companders, but, um, the next thing that you might want to think is, oh, um, the reason this was, or rather, this wouldn't be as problematic if we changed the scale on which we talked about the loudness of the sinusoid not to be power, but to be something that didn't uh, disappear quite so badly when the thing hit only half or a quarter of its amplitude. So when the sinusoid hits, on, when the sinusoid loses half of its amplitude, a half second into the cycle here, um, suddenly the thing the thing's power is multiplied by one quarter, and, and now our measurements are only moving a quarter as much. If we were doing it, say, in decibels, instead of as, um, um, as linear units, then rather than rescaling, the result would, would be shifting down, because um, if, you, uh, if you attenuate something, it's, it's, it's instantaneous power in decibels, which is a perfectly valid thing to talk about, uh, simply moves down right, by in half power, we move down six decibels, and so you would see the sh same shape, and so your uh, your attempt to get the envelope follower to work would suddenly work a lot better. Um, that's not 
Uh, that turns out not to be ideal for a complicated reason, which is this. Um, when you're doing things in decibels, uh, everything is cool while you're actually making sound, but when you quit making sound, then it starts listening to whatever's happening in the room. And so if you look at, at a graph of, of a spectrum in decibels, or if you look at the graph of, of uh, the RMS instantaneous power of a signal in decibels as, as time goes on and as the instrument starts playing and stops playing, you'll notice that there's a great deal more activity when nobody's playing or in parts of the spectrum where you're not looking or didn't want to look or not hearing anything than there is in, in the good part. Because the good part just looks like a peak and the bad part looks like crazy peaks and valleys, every, valleys everywhere. Right? So, the, uh, so decibels is actually kind of a lousy way to look at, um, to look at amplitudes in that sense, um, in the sense that uh, they care too much about silence or things that are nearly silent. But power cares. Uh, power, uh, as a as a unit of measurement, suppresses things that are quiet much too strongly. Um, so, what's a good uh, what's a good thing that you could do between power and um, and decibels? Uh, the a good answer might be this: um, decibels are in fact the limit of a process wherein you take lower and lower powers of the power of the signal. So for instance, if you take the one half power, the square root of the power, you're getting the root mean square amplitude or RMS amplitude. If you take the 0 0.3 power of power, so measured signal power raised to the 0 0.3, you get uh, ANSI standard zones. Um, if you, well, you can, if, if you, Take that process and limit it and say, I want to take the almost zeroth power of the thing, but then rescale it so that I can actually see something because the zeroth power of everything squashes everything to one. Then lo and behold, you will find, and I'm not going to prove this, you'll get the logarithmic scale back. So the logarithmic scale is actually the limit of a power scale as the power that you're raising things to goes to zero. Um, so why not uh, just find a good power to raise things to that isn't quite zero because zero is going a little bit too far in the direction of, of getting excited about nothing at the expense of, of the real signal. But power got too ex uh, power basically wasn't interested enough in the quiet parts. So there must be some power of power, if you'll pardon my bad use of the word, that, um, that gives you a reasonable, um, gives you a reasonable, reasonably varying output uh, for loud signals and for quiet signals, but still doesn't give you a whole bunch of stuff going on when the signal is really truly being quiet in some kind of psychoacoustical sense. And, well, you could go on and on and on about this. Uh, the, the thing that I like is, um, you know, the thing that I've decided to tell people to try to use, when you're trying to graph things, um, well, there are, two re there are two reasoned ways of talking about this that I can think of. One is you can say, uh, how loud is the thing psychoacoustically, in which case uh, sones would be an excellent example or a good, uh, an excellent way of thinking about the loudness. And to get sones, we were supposed to take the power and raise it to the 0.3 power, but instead we could just raise it to the 0.25 power easily enough just by taking the square root twice. So here now is measuring the square root of the square root of the power. Oh, let's look at what that looks like. Now here's, here's the square root of the square root of the power of the sinusoid. Uh, yeah, let's, um, just for a moment anyway, I'll make the thing be almost a second long so we can see the entire trajectory of the sinusoid. Ooh. What did I just do? Oh, there's a delay here. <laughs> That's interesting, but that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was this. Ta-da! This is, um, oh, let me show you what this isn't. What this isn't is this. What this isn't is the power, the measured power of the sinusoid over the length of the note, which should look exactly like a falling parabola because I just gave it a linear in envelope, and so this is what the power of that looks like. All right. Um, so if you take the square root of the square root of that, you see this. And furthermore, if you listen to it, a 
especially if you do it a lot more slowly, I think you'll agree that this is more like what you hear than was the one that, the parabola that curved upward. Uh, or to put it another way, when you're doing linear, um, when you're doing a linear fade out, halfway through the fade out, you've only dropped six decibels, which is still most of the, it's still most as, mostly as loud as the original sound was, if you think in decibels. So if that sound was in the air, in the air, if that sound was, say, 70 decibels, which is about the sound of a droning voice like mine, then it, once you've lost six decibels, you've only gone down to 6.64 decibels, and you're still clearly quite audible. Um, or to put it another way, 6 dB is about one dynamic in, in loose musical usage. Um, so difference between double forte and forte, fine. Or difference between, f well, anyway. Uh, that should be only a, a tiny portion of the descent to, uh, to silence that we're going to undergo here. And in fact, it is. Oh, let's, make the, uh, let's make this thing be just as long as the decay so that you can actually really see this awful curve. Yeah. So that's what, so this, our, so what we're doing is we're graphing the square root of the square root of the power, which is approximately Sones. And my claim is that this is about what a psychoacoustician would tell you was the relative loudness in time of that sinusoid that was fading out. All right, so this looks like this might be a much better way of dealing with the sinusoid in terms of compressing it than with the other thing, than with dealing with power directly. And so to do that, uh, now we don't have to square, take the square root of our filter output. We, in fact, to get similar units, we have to now square it. To get, this is going to give us linear amplitude units now. And then we will once more look at how we're correcting this. <laughs> All right, this is this is correct. I, did, I should have shown you this curve before because this, this is this is the the true story. Uh, the the sinusoid when. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to erase the amplitude envelope of the sinusoid altogether by compressing it. All right, I'm, trying, I'm giving it the, the, the hardest compression problem that you could possibly give it, which is just compress the thing completely, but don't distort it. And the answer should be multiply it by a thing which is one over the, um, one over the envelope that I'm giving the line. So this should look like 1 over x. And of course, it goes up to infinity. So at some point, it's going to be limited, in fact, by 25, because I did this thing to it. And then the next time the thing goes off, or the next time the, the sinusoid is triggered, the envelope follower is at, is at 25. It wants to multiply this thing by 25 to equalize its volume, which is hopeless. The volume is now at 0, so no matter what it multiplies by, it's going to be silent. But now, of course, when the sinusoid turns on, there's going to be an explosion. And all right, so we just enjoy the explosion, but we try to get the thing to shut itself up as quickly as possible by making the rise time of the slew generator as fast as possible. But then what happened was when we made that rise time fast, when we did this by measuring power, uh, this correction started to get very jagged because what was happening was the sinusoid itself was changing power very much relative to itself, and it was fixing that. So this is now a unit or a set of units on which the sinusoid doesn't get terribly quiet, at least for the, at the outset. And the resulting waveform, ooh, you're not going to be able to see that. You'll be able to hear it better than you'll be able to see it in this, at this scale. So I'll turn it back on. But now rather than do that, I'm carefully going to... So we still have embarrassment at the outset. But w what we don't have is the... Um, the square wavy sound that we had at, at the end of the sinusoid when it was getting pumped up hugely high. And now I think I can actually reduce the embarrassment here by allowing this thing to attack very quickly. There. But this is a little bit cheating because this is saying, um, well, let me see if I can graph what this does now. So now I have to graph 
the output of the envelope follower. But I need to sh graph it much faster so you can see just the outset. No, wait. <laughs> and here we have a really good measurement of the, of the envelope of the sinusoid. The only thing that's limiting it is that I want to have some decent tracking on the way down, but the better I track it on the way down, the more it wants to do that to me. So there's still a trade-off going on. All right. Now, having done all that, let me show you um, what an actual compander might look like so that you can see where this is going and what you can do with it once you've actually got it working. Um, and here I have to make a disclaimer because there's all sorts of, well, okay, I'll leave that open. I have to make a disclaimer. I've just sort of put this together in advance because it takes a long time and it's very fiddly to get this thing to work exactly right. So how did I do it? Let's see, open, compressor. Um, First thing I did was I made slew tilde be a uh, C object. That's probably not what I should have done in this context because that means that if you want to use this, you're going to have to compile the thing for your Macintoshes because I don't have this thing compiled for Macintosh. So if anyone actually wants this thing compiled for Macintosh, uh, either find someone who can find someone who's got Xcode and can type make, or else ask me and I'll try to do that. Or the other thing is, uh, I could replace this with an abstraction that would do exactly what the compander abstraction did. And I'm scared to do that right now because something will break. Okay, so what's a, what's a compander really? Well, compander is here. Um, well, all right, let's, let's go find something. sounds. There. You get the amen break out. All right. Everyone knows that. Um, all right. Now we're going to start compressing the amen break just to show you the whole thing about, uh, about companding drum sounds. Um, I think it's the case that this is a not terribly processed drum sound. Um, not sure. Someone that knows more about production than I can can tell you whether that's really a good, clean, just mixed down bunch of mics on percussion or whether that's something more complicated. Uh, but what I'm going to do is um, take that and start companding with it to show you the sort of standard things that one does when one compands drum sets or drum sounds. And this is, of course, stuff that you can do when you're... Um, sorry, this is stuff that you can do if you're doing DJ-ish stuff. Um, so the compander is the compander is the following. Take the um, there's an easy part and a hard part. Here's the easy part. The easy part is look at the uh, look at the sound. Take its instantaneous power by multiplying it by itself, and then I'm taking the square root three times. I told you to take it twice, and now I have to tell you why you might take it three times instead of twice, because there are two ways of thinking about amplitude which are in conflict, and I'm not. Basically, I'm not sure which it was, but at the time I was making this patch, I was thinking the other way. Uh, the one is sones, which is um, just how, how loud psychoacoustically the sound is in, according to some experiment that I you know, don't know how to evaluate. And that, should, and that you get, roughly speaking, by taking the square root of the power twice, by taking the 0.25 power of the power. Um, another thing that you could wish to do is make the power look like it's on a s typical mixer scale. What's a typical mixer scale? A typical mixer scale is a sliding potentiometer that says 0, plus 10, minus 30, and then things below minus 30 get real close together, and then everything above plus 10 is red. All right. In other words, it's about a 40 dB throw. Well, it just turns out that if you take the square root three times, in other words, if you take the 1 8th power of this thing, that very, not very closely, but that's, that better approximates the curve on a typical slider than does sones. And that's just the way of it. That's just a, that's just a thing that happens. And 
Um, somewhere I have a graph of this, but I'm scared to go find it right now because if I would go flailing around looking for a graph for I don't know how long. Um, so at any rate, uh, this is a lower power of the power than than uh, than Sones even, and it seems to be in some ways of thinking maybe a better way of thinking about compounding. I don't know. And if anyone wants to try to think about how, um, if anyone wants to think about theoretically what a good way to think about loudness and, and gain control is and why one power of this might be more appropriate to, than another, that might be an, that might be an interesting thing to, that, that could be an interesting project or something like that. Uh, I don't think anyone's actually written a considered paper about what a good amplitude scale is for, for compounding. People typically either just do dB or, or just do power. I believe. Anyway, so so here we we here we're measuring the instantaneous power in whatever units this is. It's the units of, of eighth root of power right now. And then we're doing the slew thing, which is exactly what was being done in that uh, abstraction in the previous patch. That's to say, it compares the incoming thing with its own previous output and looks at the difference, but limits the difference to no more than this much in the positive direction or that much in the negative direction. And then we look in a table called gain. This is a big fudge. Uh, so what's going to happen now is there's going to be some, uh, some function which tells us what the gain, what gain we should apply as a function of what our measured power is. And if that were just, um, in, in whatever the appropriate units, if that were just the reciprocal of what our measured power was, then we would come, we would theoretically come out with a thing that was completely compressed. But if, and if the gain was just one all the way across, then we wouldn't be doing any change at all. We would just be multiplying by one. And if we do something in between, then we are doing some kind of dynamic processing. Well, the, of the gain table in terms of what, when, which routine was, um, is it? You mean in terms of computation time or yeah, in terms is of? Is it like not an issue? Or? It's not an issue yeah. in a couple of ways. One is that both of those things are pretty cheap. Although the slew, if you did this out as, a, as an abstraction with a block size of one, it would be expensive. Um, but in terms of how the thing actually performs logically, it doesn't matter. It's all instantaneous. Okay, so uh, so at any rate, someone uh, someone puts someone made a table named gain that was going to be the gain I was going to apply in <coughs> in other units, and the and who cares what these units are because in fact the only reason to have any units at all here is to be able to look at the table. So here I just use square roots so that I have to square it now before I apply it, and the gain table. So this is the easy part. The easy part is just figure out what our well envelope follow the thing and then. There's a gain as a function of what our envelope is, and then we apply the gain by multiplying by the original signal and then listen to the output. The fun part is how you actually make that table. So here's a table. <laughs> and what you can see here is a gain table that is, I believe, one, but then is uh, dropping the gain when we're giving it a low input. So no expansion at all is something, well, no expansion or compression at all is, is just flatness. And then there are various configurations. One of, one of them is limiting. Limiting is when you pass the thing through when it is quiet, but as it approaches a certain limit, we start dropping the gain. And the gain could drop so severely that the thing simply did not get any louder at all, or it could be a less severe drop off. Uh, what I should do now is I should show you how this thing changes when you start changing parameters. So now what I'm going to do is, um, uh, okay, there's a, there's a, there are various things going on here. Um, the compander controls are typically an attack time and decay time and expansion factors for when we are above and below some transition point or crossover point, which for some reason I called it the knee, but there's probably a better word for that. There's probably a standard industry thing for what that crossover point is, but I don't know. 
Uh, at any rate, here, if we measure something over 70 dB, uh, we compress it by a factor of two because the high expansion is 50%. If I said 100%, then it would, and notice the table gets recalculated. If I said 100%, it would be flat. And if I said zero, it would fix it so that um, the thing approached zero in such a way as to not allow the gain to get any bigger than 70, period. Except then, it turns out you want it, frequently you don't want the gain just to be unity at the crossover point. And so I actually have a gain in dB to specify t that is the gain at the knee, which actually just functions to renormalize everything. What is zero on this table? Uh, I think I want to say something like that, so you can actually see the thing going to zero. Good. All right. And then there's a maximum gain that we permit. Oh, which we never hit. Oh, right. Of course we never do, because we never get fast more than unity gain in this example. All right. So that is uh, limiting. And then the other thing that one can do, perhaps, is, oh, right, let's move the knee up. Another thing that we can do is leave the highs alone, but fool with the lows. And, for instance, we can say, if the gain is lower than a certain amount, well, below the knee, start dropping the gain as a function of power. And what we're doing then is noise gating. In other words, what we're doing is we're taking soft things and making them softer. Or, as the thing is lower, we could, um, let's see, sorry. Uh, well, we, we could also ask for things that are quieter than that to be pushed up, and then what we're doing is we are compressing, but there are two, there are two flavors of compression. One is, is compression above this crossover point or knee, which is limiting, and the other thing is compression below it, which is more of what people standardly call compression. That's pulling the quiet stuff up to... Um, up, yeah, up to the listening range. Right. And so what does that have to do with, or what does that do to our example? Well, let's try it. Okay, so here it is coming out of the compander. Um, first thing is noise gating. So what's happening now is we're just... Uh, we're just letting the thing through when it gets a, to a certain loudness. And then uh, below that loudness, we're savagely cutting it off. And now, if we make the attack slow, then you get something rather funny, which is you get the thing played by pillows. Because now, at, at this point, the, um, when, when it gets an attack, it has to turn the gain up because it's cutting the, the quiet parts out but not the high parts. But it's only doing that at a certain speed. So it's actually fading all the attacks in for us automatically. Right. It's usually not what you want with drums. Uh, the decay time is similar. If the decay time is very fast, then as soon as it gets... And listen, there's, there's some distortion there that's... It's probably the speed of the attack and decay hitting us, right? Because notice, uh, either the attack or the decay had to be somewhat slow in order to get the envelope follower to, to be smooth, right? So this is probably not how I'd want to make it. Okay. Okay, so, um, so at any rate, here's the original. And here's the dynamic range expanded version. And the other thing that I could do is simply say, well, I'm just going to push the knee up. Oops, now I've really done it too hard. Uh, let's see. There we go. So now I've got a rather slow decay, but what I'm doing is I'm fixing the knee so that only, only the very tips of the... That's the right word. Only, only the very tips of, of the power, or peaks of the power, set the thing off, after which it starts decaying. And at this point, it's maybe useful to show you what the measured envelope looks like. <laughs> so here's, here's the envelope follower output, which is hitting peaks and then dropping off, and then, um, and then what's happening is the thing is opening only when it hits the peaks. Then it's closing pretty 
rapidly thereafter. All right. The opposite is this. Um, maybe I could do this. No. I'm going to drop the knee. Now I'm going to start. Asking for more symbols. Oh, wait. Yeah, there we go. So now what I'm doing is I'm cutting off the highs and allowing the thing to get to recover during moments that nothing loud got whacked, so that we're now emphasizing the quieter parts of the, of the sound. And now you hear the sort of seasick sound of the cymbals getting louder after they get hit. And that's typical of this. Um, and just while we're here, uh, the usual thing one does now, or rather, the thing one does, that's the right word, the thing that one, um, thing you'll hear on the radio now that is compression is what's called side chaining. So I should quickly show you what side chaining is. Side chaining is this. Uh, suppose I have a nice uh, chord. See. I'm just going to make something with a with too many harmonics so that you will hear lots of stuff. Okay, so let's do. Let's make a nice triad. Oh, except I can't do that in my head. So let's do. Let's just do a random chord. Uh, two thirty-five. Add, no, I want to add two twenty-two. What's one point one times that? Two forty-two. And then 1.2 times that is 264. And now I'm going to say output. To see if this is doing anything reasonable. Oh yeah, Rand Steigert. Okay. <laughs> mm, all right, we'll live with this. It's not really what I wanted to do, but. Uh, now I'm going to now I'm going to uh, compound that uh, side chain that in the following way. Uh, so so recall multiplying that by this gives us this uh, um, gives us this. So I'm going to take that and do exactly the same thing to it. Oops. Well, all right. It's going to be confusing. Let's see. I need and I need this thing to multiply it by. Hey. Oh. Right? And now if you add that to this, you get the side chain sound. Right? And this is um, here's a better example of that. Oh wait. There we go. Now I'm gonna take this and make it slower. That's basically how one gets that sort of full feeling that's popular on the radio right now. So now you can go post whatever you say, post, um, what's the right word? You can go master something and make some money. And this, this is side chaining. The reason it's called side chaining is because um, this is a, this is, uh, you might not have used this signal at all in its, in its natural form. You only made a side, you, you, the only purpose to, to making this submix might have been just to provide the compressor fix-it signal to apply to some completely unrelated thing that um, that you want to just have come in when that thing goes out and vice versa. All right. Is that clear? That didn't sound terribly clear when I was saying it. But if you believe it's clear, then by definition it's clear. All right. Okay. Oh yeah, and the other thing is, okay, now you can hear what decay does in another way. Is that versus that. <laughs> it's yeah, it generates seasickness, and <laughs> in fact, it's it's being dealt dealt on the FM radio band right now so heavily that uh, you can easily get seasick just driving to work because all the string synths are all doing that stuff, and, and driven by the kick drum, so it's all just on the quarter notes. It's just like ouch. Um, yeah, I'm not going to name names because I can't remember which singer I'm talking about right now. Um, 
Oh yeah, we just had Grammys, didn't we? Yeah, I missed all that, but yeah, you would have heard plenty of it there. So that's how you do that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, better just stop this topic altogether. Okay, so that is um, so that is just sort of a sound engineering point of view on on compounding, and I think I've probably forgotten to say a lot of very important things about it. Um, one very important thing about it is uh, radio, classical radio and other kinds of applications where you're concerned about signal bandwidth and modulation. You, uh, the FCC will actually make you apply a compressor to the output of your, um, of your radio station before it goes and gets modulated and sent into the air because the, um, it's the amplitude of what comes out that causes how wide the sidebands are because of FM, which <laughs> ties us into the first topic of today. And, um, and so the, the basic deal is the DJ can do whatever the DJ wants to do, but there's going to be a limiter on the end of it, which is a kind of a compressor which, which very strictly doesn't allow the amplitude of the signal to get past whatever the FCC said was the maximum modulation you're supposed to be allowed. Yes, in order to keep channels off of each other, in order to keep everybody in, in his or her own band. Right. Okay, um, this is, let's see, a reason that this might be interesting is this. Um, this raises all sorts of questions about how you really should be making this filter because, in fact, there was all sorts of hand-waving that I had to, had to do in order to talk about what the units should be that I should condition the signal into so that the filter would do the thing that I wanted it to do. And there are various ways that you might want to think about this. Okay, now let me, I'm sorry, I have to think about, should I leave this around? <laughs> this is a, this is really not a good signal to be doing this with. All right, so this is side chaining. I'm gonna just leave a comment. Okay, ta-da, all right, we're all happy about side chaining. Let's get rid of this. Um, and in fact, let's go back and get to the place where you could actually see what was going on. And now what I have to do is try to explain in some ways, oh. all right, <laughs> find notes. Oh, notes are right here. I have to try to do what's in my notes, which is give you a, give you an idea of how you could think about this in terms of a, or as a filter. So the filter explanation of this might be the following. Okay, so let's leave the, hmm. oh, oh, right. Cool, all right, get back into drawing. So here is a, here is a drawing, which I'm gonna try, which I'm gonna just make and then try to explain. And my reason for doing this is because it's only one of many, many, many possible shapes. So I'm going to draw a function which goes up to some value and goes flat, goes down to some other value and then yeah, goes flat. Now why can't I get that level? Goes flat. And those values are, mm, I don't know what, I'm not sure what labels to give, but those values are, are, are things that we select. And this is exactly 45 degrees. And this is, uh, and this is some function f of some variable x, right? Just a graph. Now, the, the thing, which is a slew limiter, is a filter whose, whose actions are described as this. The output for the nth sample is going to be equal to the previous output plus something. And the plus something is a function of, oh, sorry, a function of x, the input to right now, minus our previous output. So what I've, uh, that should be a one over there. Okay. 
That's, um, that's a filter. In fact, that's not quite the most general recursive uh, nonlinear filter. The most general recursive nonlinear first order filter would be something like this. Okay, so the, uh, I'm not sure how to label these, but here, here's another equation which is more general. Yn is some other function which I'll call g, and the function is just a function of two variables, which is the previous output, sorry, the current input and the previous output. That's, in other words, I mean, this is saying nothing whatsoever. This is just saying, um, make me anything at all, make me any function at all of whatever the input is that I'm looking at and whatever I, my previous output was, and that'll be my new output. Um, this is not the most general thing that we could make out of X and Y because we could allow ourselves also to look at older, uh, older inputs than just the current one and, and older outputs than just the previous one. We can't look at the current output because that's the thing that we're busy computing right now. Which is, um, so this is the most recent output that we can access. Um, so this is, uh, this is a very general uh, family of things that we could want to do. And here is a specific family which is a thing which... <coughs> Well, this is this. If f looks like this, is exactly the slew limiter. Why? Because what we're saying here is it clear why that limit slew, or is that? Let me just rehearse it anyway. So this is the. Um, let's see. This point here, or this height, actually is the maximum positive slew. And this, is the, and this is the minimum negative slew. And this point here is, uh, okay, so, so this line here is saying that between these, two, uh, between these two points on this interval here, which is the interval that goes between the maximum, sorry, the, the most negative slew and the most positive slew that we're going to allow, between that interval we allow the uh, output to be exactly the input. But then outside of that the output is limited to the maximum positive slew or the maximum minimum sorry, the maximum allowable slew or the minimum allowable slew, which are positive and negative numbers. Okay, sorry, I'm making a hash of explaining this. So then what this thing says is, is this. Look at how far uh, the new input exceeds our current output. Or rather, look at the difference between the new input and our previous output. Um, that's, uh, if we just took that and added it to our previous output, we would get exactly the input. But instead, what we do is we, um, uh, we allow that to happen as long as the thing that we have to add is within this range. But then outside of that range, we clip it to this maximum possible value or this minimum poss possible value. And that becomes the amount that we add to our previous output to make our new output. This is um, this is a very sp okay. This is two things. It's a special case of the most general nonlinear first order filter we could make, and the other thing is it's a particular uh, formulation of the filter. And my claim is that the formulation of the filter is actually kind of useful, even if the um, even if it's a special case the way it's been described, because uh, you could now draw some other function f. And it would make something that would whoops, and it would make something that wouldn't be exactly a slew generator or a slew limiter, but something else. In particular, uh, you might want to do something like this. I'm trying to draw a graph again. Uh, maybe you want to uh, again have uh, parameters which are a uh, maximum, or sorry, uh, which are a range of, of slews. Uh, or sorry, a range of inputs over which it gives us a linear result. Possibly the linear result itself wants to be, have a slope that's less than one. So there'll be a slope to control here. And then also possibly uh, there's another slope which might not be zero that we will apply independently on either end if we exceed the normal, uh, exceed the normal range of, of, of slew, uh, of, of difference. So what we're saying here is um, take this thing and generalize it so that these three slopes don't have to be 0, 1, and 0. Why is that interesting? 
That's interesting because this includes another special case and also, uh, and also includes everything between the two. And the special case is this. Ooh, <laughs> missed. Uh, this is f of x is equal to mx, where m is just some number, right? So you get this by making both of these limits in infinite and just choosing any slope that you want. And then what you get out of that is this. Um, that generates a filter, which is y, sub y of n is equal to x. Oh, sorry. Is the, it is the previous output plus m times. Uh, OK, this is a little ugly, but th I mean multiplication here times uh, x in minus y in minus 1. And anyone recognize what this does? Everyone is dead to the world now. <laughs> That's one of those things that you do on day one of signal processing. This is a low-pass filter. It's a one-pole low-pass filter. Um, there are other ways of writing it, uh, but what it's saying is whatever, uh, whatever our new output is is going to be the previous output plus some fraction of the difference between the input and the output. If m is 1, then uh, this whole thing simplifies to xn, and so the output is e exactly equal to the input. And in fact, the slope here is one, so the output is the input as long as you don't uh, be, as long as you don't beat the slew value that's the, the slew limits. The output tracks the input perfectly in this filter. So this uh, is different from this in that uh, instead of um, as if we drop the slope here, we make the thing be more sluggish overall for small and, and large signals alike. This is a perfectly linear filter, so it operates on small signals in, this, in a proportional way as how it operates on large ones. Whereas this one is one which we vary by varying the two limits. And again, it has, the, it has the general effect of limiting how fast the output moves, but it does a radically different thing, which is it limits how much the thing can move it in any one step, as opposed to simply attenuating how far it moves on every step, the way this low-pass filter does. And to show you where that came from, save that. I need to go back a couple of, oh no, it's right here. Yeah, here it is. Um, this is a copy of, of the compander patch from the previous one. And I didn't comment this to say all the things that I should probably have said, but what we're doing here is we're making two filtered versions of the, out, of the input. And, and I did this first to show you how the envelope follower worked better when you used a slew limiter than when you used a low pass filter. But this is this side of it is nothing but a low pass filter. The input. See, I'm going to just select this much. That's the filter. The input is multiplied by a gain, and the previous output is multiplied by one minus that gain, and those two are added. So that's, this is the way of expressing it that makes it clear that this is actually an average of the input and, and the previous output. Uh, but this is algebraically the same thing as, as what I showed on the equation, which is this. If you combine the two y n minus 1 terms, you'll see that this is m times xn and then 1 minus m times y, my, y, y n minus 1, and that is exactly what this patch is doing. see knowing nods, which probably means that those of you who don't understand this no longer care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, anyway, here's the poo-een, as, um, as Ed calls it, the punchline. Um, this family of functions here is a generalization of both of those, because I could set the two breakpoints off to large positive and negative numbers, and then you would have, let's see if I can, let's see if I can select this so that can't 
Yeah, sorry. I'm trying to select this whole thing. There, that's yeah, sort of. All right. So this generalizes both of the, both of the other two, but it generalizes in a, in a way that um, I can make it be a low-pass filter just by using the middle segment, or I can make it be uh, just a limiter by flattening, by making the middle segment have a slope of one, but flattening the outer segments. Or in fact, I can make it act like three low-pass filters, which kick in at the three different regions of the uh, of, of possible not signal input, but a possible difference between signal input and current output. In other words, if I start pulling it up too quickly, it, uh, it goes into the region here, which presumably is somewhat attenuated in how it responds, but perhaps not completely limited the way it was in the case of the slew limiter. In other words, you could have a thing which will follow the signal exactly, but then will start low passing it as soon as it starts getting, uh, as soon as it starts uh, slewing too quickly. So I claim this is an interesting family of filters, but it's not interesting enough because um, going to this equation, here's the, uh, oh, how did that happen? Oh. Here's the, hmm, sorry, there's the most general thing that you could possibly want to do. Actually, even that's the, not, not the most general, that's the most general first order thing that you could do. Just any function at all of the input and of the previous output. What I have here is a special class of these things. In other words, the output is going to be the input plus some function and of the difference. And that function, what's more, is going to be uh, specified as just uh, three breakpoints. Right. Well, so why would it be, what's the right word? Why would it be, um, ugly to try to simply offer people every possible value of g here? And the answer is a computer music answer. It's that um, people in computer music aren't, uh, aren't used to specifying arbitrary functions of two variables. The, the thing you do in computer music ever since Max Matthews is music one, I believe, but certainly music two, uh, so we're talking 57 or 58. Um, the thing that people do is they store portions of, of waveforms, if you like, in what are called function tables. And function tables are exactly these things which pure data calls arrays, like array one here. And the basic operation is to take a function of one variable represented as a stored array of numbers and then do quick table lookup on that thing in order to make sound. And the reason that's powerful is because then you can draw the thing, or you can have a sample sound be in there, or you can have some um, function that you uh, specified in some way, like a bunch of line segments or even a mathematical formula, like sinusoid. Okay, um, there is not a practice in computer music of doing this with two-dimensional tables, although people keep on proposing that and thinking they're the first person to propose it. Um, <laughs> the first time I saw it proposed was some Italian back in the 80s, and probably it was already an old idea by then. Um, the thing is, it's hard to populate and edit functions of two variables. The, the way you would want to do that is maybe with a um, sculpting tool. And it's just not a thing that is in computer practice to do that in, in the sort of way that you would take a mouse or a pen and draw a, thing, a function. Or another thing to say is um, samples, samples of sound are one dimensional. They're just functions of time. And so there isn't a nice or ready source of samples that you would put into a function of two variables. To which your rejoinder would be, cool, just get a camera and just report luminance on a field, and that's a function of two variables. But then the problem with that is, what is the sonic relevance? You know, what should a room full of chairs sound like? And the answer is, well, there actually isn't any sort of perceptual connection between what something would look like as an image and what it would do as a filter if you plugged that into this G here. Like, you could do it, but what would it mean? It would just make some kind of garbage, and you can make garbage in lots and lots of simpler ways than that. Like, you know, uh, just go Google something at random and copy the file into a sound file and play it, and you'll have garbage. <laughs> and it'll... <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it works, and people do that too. That's called conceptual art, and 
<laughs> I keep, yeah, you can, you can go find people who sonify images of, of well, whatever. Go, go on and find it if you're curious. Uh, but, the, but the trouble with that, at least in this context, is that there's actually no way of, um, uh, there's no way of making that thing obey any kind of reasonable specification of how you want something to act. So implicit in this whole discussion about compression as, as an example of a nonlinear first order filter was that there actually were things that we wanted the compressor to do that were useful. And nobody knows what, um, what things to put in G here that would actually make the family of useful filters without obliging you to just describe every possible filter in the world, most of which are probably garbage. So that's not a, that's not a, no, that's, that's not a defensible thing to say because it could just be totally wrong, but at least that's the way practice seems to look at it right now. Having said that, since we believe that this is a useful formulation, uh, in particular with f described as, these, as this family of functions, which only takes, by the way, five parameters to describe, what are the five parameters? You have to, you have to d d describe two limits and then you have to say what this slope is, and then you have to just say what these two slopes are. And then you've described, with five numbers, you've described every possible function in this class of functions. So how could you, um, how could you usefully make that then also be able to react to differences in, in x? Because right now, well, I should say, it's not a function of all possible pairs of x in and y in minus 1. It's only a function of whatever the difference between the two values is. So it's a pursuit thing. All it does is it looks at the distance between where it is and where, it, and where its input currently is and pursues the input at, at some rate that's controllable. Right? Um, well, you could make it be something like this. You could make it, uh, where do I put it? I can't put it anywhere. Let's take all this stuff. fail. Take all this stuff and see if I can make it go away. Like that. So an alternative thing that we could say is this. How about y in whoops is equal to y in minus 1. So we're still going to do a pursuit kind of way of thinking about the filter. Right. But then we're going to add a function, which I'm just going to use f again for, a function of two things. First off, it's going to be x in minus y in minus 1. And then the other thing that we're going to put in is just plain old x in. So this is in a way equivalent to this, because if I told you what this function was, you could just work out what the function would have to be of these two things. Because if I told you x in and y in minus 1, sorry, if I told you these two things, you could tell me these two things because this one is just that minus that, that minus that, that minus that. And this one is just that. So this knowledge is exactly the same as that knowledge. All, I'm, all I did was just change the, uh, change the coordinates that I used to describe the same two values. But now I could say, um, now I could represent this as five function tables because what I could do is I could say these functions are going to all be of this form except that all of these five, um, all these five parameters that describe these functions of x in minus y in minus one, this variable, are going to be functions of x in. And I'm just going to put them in five tables and just look them up and then we're back in computer music territory. So that, I claim, without any direct evidence, uh, is a general class of first, what's the right word, first order nonlinear filters that you can actually describe and think about in a coherent way. In other words, just, just, have, the, uh, just have the value of the input select, uh, basically, just have the value of the current input uh, say what the shape of the pursuit function should be at that point in time. Now, why am I going through all this? Because um, 
I actually don't have a, I don't yet have a pet problem that this solves that I can't sort of do in some kind of ad hoc way, but it would be nice to have a patch or even a PD external that just sort of did a good useful class of nonlinear first order filters. And this is my proposal for what a class of first order nonlinear filters could be that you could actually use within the uh, context of PD and, and get all sorts of slew limiter slash low pass slash uh, algorithms of the two um, that you could then perhaps uh, use in much more general ways than just limiting things or low passing things. Uh, it is now time for a break, just because I've hit a point in this where it's time to just start talking about a different subject, and I don't want to just tear off in a different direction right now. Anyway, I know that some of you have already been in class for three hours and are probably already seeing triple, so um, so we need to preserve the possibility of a break. Uh, quest <laughs> questions about this before everyone goes and gets their caffeine or whatever? Too much of a flight of fancy. <laughs> All right, so reconvene in 10-ish minutes. So the next step is going to be to start thinking about how this, this, this class of first order filters would look like when you do it in the complex plane so that you can have resonances in, in classes of nonlinear recirculating filters. So that. Okay, so my plan for the rest of the evening is to compare or to try to go back and talk about the resonance situation in the same sort of language as I was talking about slew generation. And this is, uh, this is a thing which basically just causes you to ask all sorts of questions. <laughs> so, so here it is um, in some way. Uh, first off, uh, what is the... Are these things good formulations, or is this is is any of this a good formulation for talking about what happens when you're when you're doing resonant filters? So the deal with resonant filters in a in a sort of in a, in a crude way of talking is this. Um, oh, let me save this and save and then save as so I can start over. Good if we had something more explicit going on. Okay, so I'm going to erase a bunch of this. We don't need that. We don't need that. I'm going to keep some of these equations around. I guess I don't need. Oh, that's cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, wow, powerful thing. Yeah, good enough. Okay, so the um, the two filter formulations that. Um, that are sort of at the extremes. Here's, the, here's, a, here's a simple way of thinking about it, although if you allowed f to depend on x as well, then this is a f decently general way to talk about, um, about nonlinear filters. And then this is uh, a way which is less biased in some sense because it is basically not telling you that, th this, is, this is describing a situation of pursuit. In other words, here's, here's where, here's where you want to be and here's where you are and then you have some function of the difference that describes how far you change your location as a function of your new input. Um, this is just say is almost psychologically different in some in some ways but is just saying well it's just any old function of everything. Right? In particular the um, the way you think about resonant filters is more like this. You more think about them as being a yn what am I doing wrong? I have to do this. Yn is equal to. Well, oh, I see. This thing is tilted. <laughs> there we go. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good enough. Uh, Yn is is equal to. The, it's going to be equal to the input plus some function, some constant times the previous output. And a way of describing what that does, or ways of describing what that does, is if we're talking about real numbers, it does things like this. This could be time 
and this could be values, and the basic thing that it does is it just drops an exponential envelope on everything. And if you give it another input, it clicks up to whatever that input is and then starts another exponential fall. I mean, this is a, that's an over schematized way of, of talking about it. But that psychologically is what this thing does. It just exponentiates towards the origin, whereas psychologically what this thing does is it pursues the input. And um, it turns out that this is a better way to think about resonance because the resonant filter looks something like this. It's a, okay, so this is now the complex plane. We're, we're leaving out time because we don't have another dimension to do time in, but this is going to be real and imaginary. And we're going to do something to it that puts it somewhere, and then it responds by spiraling in. Except, of course, we can perturb it again by throwing it somewhere else, and then it would respond simply by continuing to spiral in. So that's sort of what this thing does by way of a behavior. All right. uh, that's a terrible picture, but anyway, there, there you have it. And then the deal was, uh, okay, in, in its linear form, as long as it's stable, basically all it ever does is just spiral, spiral in toward the origin, but then there are nonlinear ways of messing with it that cause it to do interesting things. And the interesting things that, that, uh, that we saw so far actually had two different forms. There was one which was um, what I was calling the uh, flexitone, which is a situation where it has one speed of going around at one radius and has some other <coughs> perhaps radically different speed of going around at some higher ra radius. Right? So that depending on how much energy there was in the filter, it would have a different resonant frequency. Um, but here, uh, but here, I, uh, just, to, just to make it put it in its simplest form, the, uh, the way you would deal with, with radius is you would just always have the thing spiraling in toward the origin as before. Um, another possible thing, and this was the forced oscillator. I'm not really sure that's the right term for it. Oops. Is this. It's a thing which actually has a, it has a path that it prefers. And other paths spiral either into it or out to it or into it like that. And so there would be a, a fixed point somewhere in here that it couldn't spiral away from, but as long as it got off that point, then it would then it would eventually reach into this limit cycle. <coughs> All right. Um, there are probably many, many other kinds of behaviors that you could describe, but the next one that I think sort of fits in a logical sequence with these so far is the situation where Sorry, running out of space. A situation where the thing has different speeds depending on where you are in the circle. <laughs> All right. And then if you if you drew what that would look like, well, its frequency is changing as a function of its own phase, so it is in some sense self modulating FM, which suddenly suggests that next meeting when it's time to start putting two of these things together and making them do things to each other, uh, one of the things that we can do is FM just by making one of them affect the other one's speed of rotation. Right. But for right now, rather than do that, I'm just going to say that um, if you were to take a sinusoid and just change the speed at which it did various uh, parts of its trajectory, so, for instance, you're just looking at the x-axis of this, say. You could make all sorts of random waveforms. Um, the, the only gotcha is that as it comes around this end and as it comes around that end, that's to say as, as it's moving vertically, if we're looking at, the, at just the horizontal axis as output, it always looks like it stops and then changes direction. So there's going to be some stupid moment where the thing uh, just sort of makes a horizontal, I'm, I've stopped now, but between that, you can have it do anything monotone. Well, not that. <laughs> it has to be a function of time. But you can make it go faster or more slowly toward the other extreme and back. So you can start designing waveforms like that simply by um, describing as a function of the angle that we're at what the precession of the thing is going to be. So there are two things that we specify at, at every point in the plane. 
One is the um, one is whether we are going outward or inward. In other words, uh, what is the new magnitude as a fun as a fraction as a multiple of the old magnitude? In other words, by what proportion do we change the magnitude? And the answer is, if we're linear, all we do is we just constantly drop it by a fraction. But in nonlinear situations, we can make it do anything we want. And and furthermore, what do we do to the um, to the angle? And here, what I've been saying is, uh, yeah, the angle change doesn't depend on on the angle itself, but only depends on either an external factor, which I haven't mentioned, or the um, or the radius. But angle could depend on angle, and decay could end on depend on radius too. And if you think of those four things as just sort of being four possibilities, uh, th this is one of the two that we haven't discussed. The other one that we haven't discussed is what if radius depends on radius, or what if, sorry, what if the pushing, uh, what if the gain doesn't depend on radius, or does depend on radius? Sorry, so here here we had gain depends on, sorry. Here we had gain depends on radius. Oh, I, we have touched that. I'm sorry. There's a fourth thing that we haven't touched, but my brain can't get there from here somehow. Oh, right. It's, <laughs> it's that the gain could depend on the angle, which is to say we wouldn't trace circles. We would trace, say, ellipses or something crazy like that. But that, I think, has actually got less going for it than the other three. Okay, so... Um, so this is the this is the thing that is remaining to mess with, except for a whole bunch of other stuff, which is represented by this. Um, all I'm doing is I'm saying that the thing that we multiply could be a function of the current state of the filter. To put it another way, what are these things as filters? What uh, what what these things at least have been so far is the following. Whatever the point is that we're at, we multiply by some number, which is to say we rotate and we squeeze or, or expand. And we do that as a function of where we happen to be. In other words, it could be variable depending on where we are. And then we just add the input without uh, mixing the input, without having the input affect us any, any more interestingly than just getting added into whatever the state is. Right. Um, the, what happens could in the future be some much more complicated function of the input and, and, and of our state. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, as long as we are just describing this family of resonant filters, then if we just describe k as a function of, of where we are, and I'll simplify that slightly by saying, well, k could be a function either of the radius or of the angle, but I won't try to make it be a function of both of those at the same time because that would be a function of two real variables, and that would be a, a harder thing to specify or to to explore than just making it depend on one at a time. So I can say about this k, it um, this which which simultaneously describes the decay and, and the and the frequency of resonance uh, that this could depend in any any way that we want to, but separately on our radius and on our uh, angle. So far, it's only we've only talked about dependences on radius, which are the easiest thing to describe because radius is easy to get and make things functions up. But now it's time to make something depend on the angle. And the thing that's going to be interesting is just make the resonant frequency depend on the angle. OK, was that, that was kind of long-winded. But anyway, there it is. And then we've sort of gotten most of, I think, most of what's interesting until we start mixing x into the thing, which we're not going to do because we'll just start coupling, <coughs> coupling things together instead. All right, so to do that, uh, first off, uh, Quick review to, to to show you or to explain where we are. This thing here is the is the flexitone patch. This is the thing that uh, had a resonant frequency that depended on the uh, depended on the amount of energy inside the filter. That's to say, depended on the radius. And now the uh, the thing that I haven't done and just and can just now is take this output, which is the phase. Oh yeah. So this this wonderful unit polar object puts out the radius and the phase, and the phase is going to be a thing that varies from 0 to 1. And the phase, I'm going to use just as another source of inspiration for setting whatever this angle is. So the angle here is, ooh, could I just get rid of this altogether? I bet I could. Not sure. It's not doing anything because I'm multiplying by zero, so I'll just leave it because maybe it's better to leave it than to take things out. 
Okay. So what's so what's happening now is we're we're confecting a, a we're we're confecting a rotation on this pair of things, which is to say the the real and imaginary part of the state of the filter. And the rotation is going to depend on well, I can just have it be a constant, and then uh, later I could make it depend on stuff. Right. So now just to go back here. Let's just look at it linearly, and I'll feed it with noise so it's clear what it's doing. It's doing nothing because the two outlets here. Oh, you know, that's just the. All right. Well, I see something. What I hear is nothing at all. That's probably because. So oh, look, this number's very small. Oh, I know. <laughs> I haven't given it a resonant frequency yet. So, and then I was. <laughs> yeah, never mind. Let's give it a resonant frequency. Uh, this w is in thousandths. There it is. Oh, I need to give it. Um, I need also to give it a radius, do I? Yes, because if this is, yeah, all right. Let's uh, careful, let's cut this off before I change this, because this is a thing which could make the filter unstable. I'm gonna make it 99% and then try this again. There it is. All right, resonant filter. And then the deal before was we could make it depend, its state depend on how much energy it was using this coefficient. And then we get, oh, cool. Then we get thing whose resonant frequency depends on how much we pump it with, except it's much too much now. Yeah, there we go. And then we have that thing going. All right, now, uh, but let's not have that go on. And in fact, what I want to do now is quit driving it with noise because it's going to be interesting now to drive it with an oscillator, I think. Actually, I'm not sure whether that's true or not. We'll see. Oscillator. So, so far, uh, so right now the filter is linear. I'm not doing any dependence on this, and so it's sinusoid in, sinusoid out, because that's how linearity works. And I can presumably make funky stuff here, but I'm not going to do that because I'll get much funkier stuff by doing the other thing, which is having this depend on the angle. And to do that, I'm just going to make there be a table so that I can just put stuff in the table that, that we can check out. So to do that, I need to... Um, I'll make a table with 103 points and take this thing which ranges from 0 to 1 and just um, look it up in the table in the usual way. Uh, let's see. Oh, tan read for, no. And this is going to be called something like twist. I don't know. That's not a good name. can't think of a good name, so I'll just call it twist now. And this is now going to be the amount that we add to this thing, and I'm not sure what the range should be, so I'm going to also give it a range control. Yeah, and we just add all these things together. Am I getting... Yes, and of course, there's no such array as a twist. Now I have to make an array twist. I'm going to give it 103 points. Points is good. And what I'm just going to do is give it two values for now so that we can enjoy. Oh, yeah, we need to graph the output too. That. All right. <laughs> Whatever. Come on, give me a horizontal line. All right, doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, uh, now I need a, another thing to graph it. Graph the output. So another array. I'm call this one graph. Yeah, that's probably a bad name. Well, do it anyway. See if we can get in trouble. And I probably want a thousand points of this stuff. Maybe two thousand. Oh, come here. And meanwhile. Then 
I'll say, all right, tab right graph. And I just need a button for that. And I want to look at the output of the filter. Nothing good. All right. Uh, okay. So now what we've got is sinusoid driving table. And let's um, just for simplicity's sake, or just for um, good luck or something like that, let's uh, actually make this thing's resonant frequency hit the sinusoid, which we do just by fishing for it. And it's about there. I'm looking at the, these numbers and trying to maximize it. There's about the resonant frequency. Uh, okay, and there's the radius, which is still good. And now what I'll try to do is start putting twist in here. It's going to happen. Yeah. And what comes out is this. Okay, I need to be able to turn, make this thing be zero. Yeah, all right. Cool, all right. I knew intellectually this would happen, but will be better. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so um, <coughs> what's happening is this. This is not easy to analyze in all of its glory because, um, oh, I could make it easy to analyze. Let's make it easy to analyze by doing this. Um, what I need to be able to do is turn off the oscillator altogether and feed an impulse that, but then give it uh, exactly 100 here. And now what we've got is nothing. Oh, why is it, why is it uh, decaying? Hmm. I told it not to decay. All right, well, I have to now build the nice uh, thing that makes it be forcible, which is this. Um, I wasn't planning to do this. Let's, let's make this a, an oscillator instead. So what, what I'm going to do now is redo this business, which, sorry, this business, which gave it a, a, a limit cycle that it liked to have. And the way you do that is you measure the, uh, measure the radius and subtract one from that which then gives you a negative number if, if it's too small and a positive number if it's too large. So then you multiply it by whatever gain you want that helps force you into the middle, and then you add 1. So the deal now is um, if the thing is exactly 1, you get 0, and then you get 0, and then you just get 1 times. And this just goes right here. And then if, um, let's see, if this is less than, if this is less than one, you get negative here. Ooh, so I need to, and then I need to multiply it by negative 0.1. There it is. And so if, it's, so if it's too small, this thing makes it grow very slightly, and if it's too large, it makes it drop very slightly. The, 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 um, this thing is the speed at which it hones in on one, and that has nothing to do with the limit cycle, but has to do with how fast it gets to the limit cycle. And now we start putting the twist back in on it. Hates me. I guess I have to drop this. All right. All right. Let's see if we got anything yet. Nothing. Well, we got some funny stuff here, but it's not enough to go on really. There we go. All right. Now we're getting stuff. 
So what I'm doing is I'm asking it during portions of its um, during portions of its cycle to go faster because I'm adding to the frequency as a function of where it is. So the more I add, the more it gets like that. And I can and I can ask it actually to slow down at certain points until I tell it too much to slow down and then it stops. So if I give it a place where um, where it doesn't where where the rotation speed goes down to zero, in fact, presumably if it goes negative, it passes through zero to get negative. Then it doesn't want to rotate anymore, and so it just sort of sits there. So there's a limit to how negative I can go in this thing, and I've already exceeded the limit very very quickly. So let's go back. Let's see, I can get it started again, oh, just by changing that. <laughs> and now, well, actually I don't know, I don't know what it's doing, and I was planning to pump it with a sinusoid, so let's try that again. <laughs> Okay, this is a very badly behaved function. <laughs> um, I always reach for the badly behaved functions. Uh, what a, a way to think about what's going on here is that what's happening here is we're, we're sweeping around from, well, we're sweeping around an entire circle and we're changing the speed that the oscillator goes at at different points along the circle. There's a, uh, there's a, sampling issue here, which is that I could easily actually even jump over one of these points if I was going so quickly as a result of the previous point that it pushed me over, uh, over to some other point in the cycle. How long is the cycle now? It's, uh, the cycle is, let's see, this is 2,000 points and there are about 20 cycles, so it's about 100 points-ish, which means on average it's hitting each one of these points about once before going on to the next one, but certain times here we're actually probably skipping forward a couple of points in the table. So it's actually probably hitting some of these things on some cycles and not hitting it on others or something like, or hitting it differently on each cycle. So this thing will not actually give us a thing which gives us, which sounds kind of nice and repeating until I give it a much gentler, more gently changing function, perhaps more gently than I can draw. So let's see. Zero again. I should make a nice smooth looking function and then I should try to draw it. Okay, so what you see here is that it's a sinusoid, it's a thing like a sinusoid except that part of the cycle it goes very, very quickly over. Right? And now I have a nice index of modulation I can play with right here. Oh, right, and I can make it slow down. And I get away with that only a, only a moment or two. And if I push it any further negative than that, it's going to get stuck at some phase and not be able to oscillate anymore. All right, so if I give it even minus 0 0.02, it just stopped dead at some phase or other. And it will stay there until I let it move off of that value. Yeah, sounds like a party favor. And of course, you also always, anytime you get something like that, just try pumping it with a sinusoid. Which I'll do very gently. There we go. And now as I That's the, this is probably the same thing as what you're doing when you're singing into a trombone. And of course, when you make intervals, 
you get specific kinds of limit cycles. And when you make tritones, you get that kind of thing. And when you make subsonic sounds, you just get modulation. <laughs> Theoretically, you got everything in here that you got when you are asking people to sing into their brass instruments. <laughs> Although, in practice, I suspect they can make it sound a lot better than this. So Questions about what I'm doing here? Where, where exactly does the distortion come from? Is it sample? Really? I think, okay, so what you mean by distort? Yeah, the, the fact well, that it's, it's not being not nice really and beautifully mean. periodic. Yeah. Well, there are two things. Uh, if, I, if I stopped pumping it at all, if I turn this to zero, I still get a non-periodic sound. Well, not yet, but I can. I will as soon as I push the gain here. That, that is... Uh, that is... There are two ways of thinking about that. Uh, one is that we are... Uh, I can't, exp I can't articulate either way of thinking about it. <laughs> okay, one way of thinking about it is that um, as, we're, as we're bopping around the circle, we hit different parts of the table, and therefore, we, uh, if they don't add up to the same number, we get a different length period. Uh, and that ultimately, that should be less and less of a factor the higher our sample rate was or the slower we went around. So in fact, if I dropped the, oh, can I just, um, if I just take this uh, frequency uh, and add a scalar to it, I can take the entire thing and speed it up and slow it down, which gives me a, just a transposition, which is probably the way to understand that. So let's just disconnect this, get myself another scalar, and throw it in here. And who knows, I might have just kind of destroyed everything. So let's see if I got sound. Huh. Well, Change pitch, but maybe that's because I just changed this some. So I can take this beautiful sound here and now just transpose it. So let's see if this works. Let me give it a little more juice. Yeah. And sure enough, it gets cleaner as we do it slower. So what this means is that at some point here we start getting, it's not fold over exactly, it's not exactly correct to call this fold over. It could be called integration error. In other words, we're, we are integrating a differential equation here, or, although I'm pretending we're not. And at some point the error starts to get out of control. Oh yeah. Oh. Maybe. So here's my nice forcing thing. And now if I just, oh, interesting. Oh yeah, right, okay, so here's, what's going on there is this. Uh, oh no, I'm already, I'm already playing that. Here's the, here's the uh, pitch at which I'm forcing it. pitch. Whoa! So that, if I, if I pump it enough, with enough of it, I'll force this pitch to that. But if I don't do it quite enough, it finds its way to a subharmonic of it. So right now it's <laughs> making a trefoil. And then if I push this up a little bit more, it finally has to, has to do this. Eventually you can force it to the frequency that you're trying to get it to play by pushing this far enough. Now why does the timbre change? No. And that's, of course, fighting against this.
questions about this? How is this not breaking down in a block size of one? There's just so much stuff happening. It's not much. Well, it's a lot of function calls. That's not a whole lot. That's some. Um, and each each one of these is like twenty times as expensive as it should be. So we're paying for about twenty of these patches. We're still plenty of room. Yeah, plenty of headroom. Let's see. Uh, oh, this is even going to lie because I haven't kicked my CPU into high speed yet. But even if even at the low speed setting of my CPU, I'm eating fifteen percent. Yeah, Fexper is full programming environment. <laughs> you could you could write a C compiler in it. <laughs> Actually, don't do that, but <laughs> theoretically, I guess you could. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the word on the street is that Fexper is a lot faster than doing it this way, but is a lot slower than C. It's somewhere, like this might be a thousandth the speed of C or something like that, and Fexper is only a thirtieth of the speed of C, maybe or something like that. So one ends up, pretty soon one ends up just giving up and going to C. If, you know, if you're, if you're trying to make a whole amount of music. All right, so um, where this goes from here is to try to generalize the idea of just pumping a filter with an oscillator, but rather than making the filters more general, um, my plan at least is to, is to sort of leave that as, a, as an exercise to anyone who wants to pick it up to try to sort of think about more general structures for, for first order real and complex filters. And instead I want to talk about what happens when you couple two or more of these things together. Uh, in the simplest of possible ways because there are many, many possible couplings that you could make between oscillators. But it's a, it's a thing that, I don't know, it goes at least back to the Buchla synthesizers of the 70s, the idea that if you've got two oscillators, you can make one of them essentially reset its phase when the other one hits a certain threshold or something like that. And uh, although doing that specific thing doesn't work terribly well when you do it digitally, uh, there are other things that are maybe like that or perhaps inspired off it that are workable digitally that, um, that make a wide variety of sometimes slightly predictable things, but <laughs> in, many, in many cases highly unpredictable things. So that's kind of the next thing to look at is, is hooking os yoking oscillators together in, in more interesting ways than just pumping one oscillator's output into a filter. But that said, taking this forced oscillator and pumping it with a filter has already been shown to be kind of interesting. Like, even if I throw this table out altogether, oh, sorry. Here's no table at all, so that we're just oscillating. Oh, what are we doing? This should be an oscillator now. Oscillator. Even here now, if I just take this oscillator and start forcing it with, with another one. That's too close of frequency to be interesting. stuff that I uh, showed you last time and it's rather quickly, but um, when you take two of these oscillators and actually give them both access to each other's state to mess with, then, um, then the possibilities start to take off. So that's the next thing to explore. There is no class next week, as I understand it, so we will convene again in two. And what else should I say about that? That's kind of it. Uh, things that you want me to explain more carefully or go into in a more serious way that I've only touched on. If you have requests of any of that, of that nature, don't hesitate to write and ask. And to the extent that I can, I'll be happy to comply. Um, 
the rest of the quarter, as I understand it, is um, the, the, the major topics that I have to look at are coupling oscillators together, um, going back and doing nonlinear reverberators, which is doing things that have longer delay times but making them, allowing them to have nonlinearities in their thing, which actually gets, uses some of the same concepts as coupling oscillators, but is, is different in some ways. And then uh, a sort of random thing about, well, I can call it random, um, video feedback and other kinds of um, kind of media, media-ish ways that you can use feedback. Actually, the specific examples I have in mind are rooms as acoustic elements and also video as, a, as an acoustic, and not as a, but as a possible feedback medium. So coupling oscillators, nonlinear reverberators, and media, or other more complicated things, I guess. And then I was going to do control theory, but I think it's just too dry and boring, so I think I'm going to just kind of skip it, except maybe to show you a couple of instabilities in reverb land that would make you wish you knew a little control theory. <laughs> Questions or other? All right, well, it's way early, but I think that's kind of the end of that subject and time to time to go stare at the wall or something. <laughs> So it takes a lot more juice to couple it higher frequencies. Sorry. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> it's, is there an answer to that question? There should be. Yeah, it's not interesting like that. Um, <laughs> let's see. The answer that might be. Uh, all of these. This is linear, and all these things are various ways of introducing nonlinearities into it. Okay. But like in it's just nonlinearities. I don't know. Things are or whatever. Yeah. It just is. Folks, well, you're talking about the radius versus using the angle. Yeah. That when the radius uh, is a nonlinearity, I guess. Uh, yeah, there's there's just things with nonlinearities in them. I'm not sure there's any better way to say yeah, No, that's fine. I was just wondering if that was. I did. Alright, thanks. Nice